And we're going to try and get everything on this board. This is your 11 by 17 piece of paper. Might have a cheat come over here a little bit, but for the most part, I'm going to try and get it on this board. We're going to start with a cell. Let's start with chapter one. And again, I don't know why we start at the bottom right. I think it's because by the time we get to the top left, that's where the important stuff is. So chapter one is what are the initial conditions? So I have to write a little small because I want to, I don't know, I mean, I love this room because I have a lot of board, but I want you to be able to see this as your 11 by 17 sheet of paper. So what are the initial conditions and what sets them up? If you, if, if I make a mistake, I mean, you're going to be redrawing this. There's no doubt that you're going to want to redraw this. You're going to have to sit down at your kitchen table several times and draw this to make sure that you have it for the test. The answer to this question is the sodium potassium ATPase. So we've drawn the sodium potassium ATPase before. So let's draw a cell. It doesn't have to be a huge cell. But this is just a model cell, so that's a cell. It's every cell in the body, technically. The sodium potassium ATP uses up an ATP to put a circle that's indicating the pulp. And then I like to coordinate colors. You don't have to, it takes too much time. But you're going to pump three sodium out. You're going to pump two potassium in. And that's going to set up one of our initial conditions, which is a concentration gradient. So we're going to set up a concentration gradient. And these first four chapters, four and four chapters, they're going to be fairly similar. They're going to just add a little bit of information with each new chapter. But the first one is, is obviously, if you're pumping sodium out, sodium's on the outside. Sodium on outside cell. And there'll be times, give yourself some big gaps over here so we can write some stuff on there. There'll be times when we need to talk about how there's sodium on the inside. Because you don't pump it all out, you just pump most of it out. That won't actually be today, but we'll put it on there just for But then also, since you're pumping potassium in, leave space in the middle, because we're going to write in the middle. And then again, leave some space over here. Potassium on inside of cell. And again, some potassium. It's not relevant today, but it will be relevant at some point. But you need to know it's not all the potassium on the inside. There's some on the outside. Also, since you're pumping three positive ions out and only two positives back in, you're setting up a charge gradient. You're setting up a charge. Could be a voltage. That's another term. Or it's also called a potential. Potential, you want to, at least when we're talking about electricity, you want to know that potential is the same as charge. Potential gradient. And if you have space, Sometimes, although not very often, this one up here is called an ion gradient too. So it's called a concentration gradient or an ion gradient. That one is not real important. So what do we mean by a charge gradient? We mean the inside of the cell is negative. Okay, if you're pumping three positives out, and only taking two positives, positives back in, 
then that means you're making the outside of the cell a big gap here. You're making the outside of the cell positive. And this always frustrates me because when we talk about tonicity, concentration, hypertonic, isotonic, hypertonic, we talk about the outside of the cell compared to the inside. But when we talk about the voltage, we talk about the inside compared to the outside. So we, talk about the, we don't talk about the outside of the cell as positive. We talk about the inside of the cell as negative. So the inside of our cells are negative. All of our cells are like little batteries. And the way we talk about that is the voltage of the membrane which is abbreviated VM. Voltage of the membrane is abbreviated VM. It's usually, it varies by cell, but it's usually around negative 70 MV, which stands for millivolts. You're going to see that probably 50 times between 81 and 82, a cell that sets up a voltage. Because all cells do this so that it lets sodium back in if it takes glucose with it. But certain cells like neurons, muscle, including the heart, change this voltage. And the reason they change this voltage is because that's the fastest way the human body can change something. Like the lights are using electrons and electricity, which are really tiny. But the tiniest thing that we have that we can change back and forth to change a charge back and forth are ions. So it's not as fast as electricity, but it's still pretty fast. All right, uh, chapter two. Hopefully we know that I always run out of a little space here. Chapter two is why do ions move? And the answer is gradient. But you got to be more specific than that because there's a concentration gradient. It's also called a chemical gradient. Maybe that's what we're focusing on. You got to get used to multiple terms for the same thing: concentration gradient, ion gradient, or chemical gradient. Are all the same thing? Where does, so where does sodium want to move? If you open up a pore, let sodium move. It's concentrated on the outside, so sodium wants to move in. You could put by the fusion. There's more sodium on the outside, less sodium on the inside. It wants to move in just by the fusion. And potassium wants to move. By the fusion. But then you also have that charge, voltage, or potential gradient. And that one, sodium still wants in because the inside of the cell is negative. Sodium wants in because the inside of the cell is negative. What's potassium want? Potassium wants to stay in. Concentration gradient is stronger than the electrical gradient. Concentration is greater than electrical or voltage. Actually. Are you going to 
actually write that over here with a little symbol. I like symbolism. Like if you have a channel that let both of these go at the same time, sodium would come in much more. So I'm trying to draw a better, a bigger area. I'm sorry, a bigger arrow. For potassium. Sorry. <sighs> trying to draw a bigger arrow for sodium wanting to come in versus potassium. That does come up in muscle. When you want to stimulate a muscle, you just open a channel that lets both of them go through. And since sodium wants to come in more than potassium wants to leave, it does change the voltage. There's another situation in the heart where you open up a potassium and a calcium channel, and those two want in and out at the same rate. So potassium leaves at the same rate calcium is coming in, and the voltage does not change. But sodium and potassium, sodium wants in more than potassium wants out. The third piece, third chapter, is how do I And for some of you, I know it's a little bit <clears throat> being redundant, but it's better to break it up into the simple parts. How do ions move? Ion channels. So cells have tiny little holes to let ions go through, and they're usually pretty selective. So there's just a sodium channel, there's just a potassium channel. Sodium does not go through potassium, potassium does not go through sodium. So draw yourself a cell again. And if you're writing in pen, um, wait till I'm done. So leave a gap right there, leave a gap right there, leave a gap right there, and then there's a tiny gap down here. So I'm using dry erase, so I can use my finger to erase, but if you're writing a pen, you just want to draw a circle with four gaps in it. The first type of ion channel, so there's four types of ion channel. There's voltage-gated, ligand-gated, mechanogated, and then leak. Two of them are going to show up on this diagram, so you'll notice that when we draw a voltage-gated channel, it shows up over here, shows up over here. When we draw a ligand-gated channel, it shows up over here. So you definitely need to know these for now. I'm going to draw a closed one first. So this is a voltage. Gated, or sometimes I'll abbreviate it dependent, voltage dependent channels. What they do is open based on VM. They respond to the voltage of the membrane. And so a closed one has a little gate that stays closed, and it has these little positive charges. And those positive charges are attracted to the negativity on the inside of the cell. So if it's negative 70 millivolts on the inside, those positive charges are attracted to the negativity inside the cell. If you can get that voltage to change to like plus 30, we'll make it extreme in this case. If we make the voltage of the cell plus 30, then those positive charges are not attracted to the inside of the cell anymore. So they slide out. So it slides out a little bit, which means it's open. So this is open, and this one is closed. So based on voltage, the channel could be open or closed. And we can, I do this in different orders. Harness and Pebble call me out that I did it in a different order for her class. But it doesn't matter too much, I don't think. We can be specific down here and say that there is a voltage dependent potassium channel. And the voltage dependent potassium channel opens at plus 30 millivolts. It likes the inside of the cell to get to plus 30. The gate slides out, the channels open. There's also a voltage dependent B dependent sodium. And this one opens, just to emphasize, it doesn't have to go all the way to positive voltages. It can be a slight change in voltage. 
This one opens at negative 55 millimeters. And something that's going to be relevant when we get to this is this channel has a plug that's called an inactivation gate. So it has a plug that swings in and closes the channel. So we'll come back to that. All right, so voltage gated channels respond to the voltage of the membrane. Sometimes it's a huge shift to plus 30, the gate slides out, the channel's open and potassium can come in. I'm sorry, potassium can leave. Sometimes it's a small shift in voltage to go to negative 55. These little positive charges are not as attracted as what they were when they were negative 70. So they slide out and this channel is open. Those are voltage gates. You also have ligand gating, or sometimes they're called chemical. What these guys do is they open when they bind a chemical. Open when binding a chemical. Ligand, that one, L I G A and D. So these have a little binding spot. Maybe I should have made that. All right. They have a little binding spot. And if nothing's bound, they stay closed. If they bound something, then the gate is open. I'm trying to squeeze that in, but if it's bound a chemical, it opens up a little bit. If it has not bound this chemical, it doesn't open. And again, these are going to come back up here. So these will be back later. All right, that's ligand gated. And those are going to show up on this drawing. Next one is leak and draw this one really small. That one's always open. And this one's going to be important when you get to the heart in the AMP2 because this one helps control heart rate. I never know whether I should overwhelm you with this, but we're going to draw an action potential today. It looks like this. So action potential is a change in voltage over time. When you start AMP2, you're going to see an action potential like this. And that's heart rate. And then you're also going to see, so the other reason that I'm drawing this is so that you realize, hey, I better know these action potentials. Because they're going to come back in AMP2. This is heart strength. And honestly, I think everyone wants to know about this because we're going to be talking about sodium, potassium, and calcium affecting this action potential. Sodium, potassium, and calcium will also affect your heart rate and your heart strength. The thing is, is you can affect sodium, potassium, and calcium with your diet, with drugs, and if your kidneys are failing. All those things will throw off your action potentials. The EKG is measuring this particular action potential as it goes through your heart. Yeah, exactly. Nice. Um, and then the last one, it's not one that we're ever really going to deal with, but I figure since we've talked about the three, we should talk about the last one. And this one is mechanogated. So then if the electricity goes a different way through your heart, you know something's happened to your heart. Or another big one is if you have too much potassium or too sodium, you see that on the EKG. A candidate is open by force. And this is hearing and touch. So we'll draw a closed channel first. So that one's closed. I guess we should go back up here and say this one is closed. This one is the open. Chemical bound is the open. It says closed. You can tip this open. 
that's supposed to be a sound wave. And so now we're open. So literally, you're hearing my voice right now. Because my sound wave is hitting my voice, it's making a sound wave in the air that's hitting your eardrum, that's being magnified by your inner ear. It's actually moving the fluid in your ear, which is moving these gates in your cochlea, and so you can hear me. So literally the force of the sound of me pushing the air with my, that sounds weird, but pushing the air with my mouth with my larynx is moving a gate, opening it for you. Or when you touch, you push these gates open, and then the nerve knows, hey, this gate has been pushed open by this touch, and so I've been touched. Fourth one is fairly simple, but it's just to be absolutely sure you know what's going to happen when sodium moves in or when potassium moves up. Did you get it? Huh? Just trying to give you a duck face. Duck face induces. The fourth one is is what happens when ions move. And the answer is you change VM. So when sodium moves in, it raises VM to positive voltages. That one's easy because sodium's on the outside. It wants in because of the chemical gradient. It wants in because of the electrical gradient. It's a positive charge moving in. Therefore, it's going to make the cell more positive. It's going to make the VM more positive. Potassium is a little bit harder because you got to reverse it in your head. But get this one because, again, you're going to be talking about potassium affecting ACT potentials. If you go into nursing, potassium affecting EKGs. So you want to see how that works. When potassium moves out, again, it wants out by diffusion. It wants to stay in by electrical, but concentration is more, diffusion is more strong than electrical. When potassium moves out. It decreases VM to negative voltages. And again, you have to flip that around because a positive charge is leaving the cell. So that's the same as the inside of the cell is becoming more negative. If you want to put another step in there, a positive cell, positive charge leaving the cell makes the outside more positive. If the outside is more positive, then the inside has to be more negative. Yeah, I'm working ahead, but this one's going to come up later. I like a negative color. Chloride's a negative color for me, and I have a limited range of colors with dry erase markers, so I'm going to go with orange. But use whatever you want. Chloride is on the outside of cells. It's concentrated on the outside of cells. So when chloride moves in, its negative charge makes VM more negative. And that's going to come up later when we're talking about, I don't want to take an umbrella. OK, so you have the idea mentioned it a few times, that we can change this voltage over time to signal. So how does that look? So chapter five is how does fast signaling occur? And the answer is change voltage which is potential over time, which is action. So it's not my favorite word in all physiology, but it's called an action potential. I 
it just doesn't hatch potential just doesn't convey what it is. You have to twist it around to get okay, the potential means voltage. The action means it's changing. That's what an action potential is. But we're going to consistently draw this just as a graph. So leave a little space next to the axis. We'll put voltage there because we're tracking voltage. We're going to track that over time. And technically it's in milliseconds, but we don't need to get all wrapped up in how many milliseconds does depolarization take. There's four key voltages. Three of them are on the board already. Negative 70. Because that's a rest. Right now, your neuron is trying to decide whether you take an umbrella is at rest because it's not raining. Clearly, we know negative 55 is important. So negative 55. We know plus 30 is important. Then we should also just keep track of zero. So right now, our neuron that makes decisions about whether to take an umbrella is just resting, resting, resting. Rain starts to hit the roof. You look outside, you see it's raining. Your neuron starts to decide, is this a day where I should take an umbrella? Or is this a day where I'm going to tough it out and run? If you do decide to take an umbrella, you kind of have to suspend what's happening right here. We'll talk about that in a second. But something gets you to negative 55. If you get to negative 55, that's when the voltage dependent sodium channels open. Sodium rushes in. When sodium rushes in, it raises your voltage. After they've all opened, the sodium channels have this inactivation plug. That plug swings in and stops the channel, blocks the channel, closes the channel. And also at plus 30, you've got these voltage-dependent potassium channels open. Potassium leaves the cell. When potassium leaves the cell, bless you, bless you, the voltage goes back down. For some reason, those channels stay open a little too long. I mean, you'd think it would take you just right back to negative 70, but it doesn't. It takes you to negative voltages, and then you recover back to negative 70. And if you wanted, it's not an important detail, but some people wonder, like, how did you get back up to negative 70? What is this right here? I'll write it really small, but it's not that important. This right here. Is the sodium potassium ATP. It's not on your test, but some people ask what is causing that, and it's the sodium potassium ATPase. So Trace things back out. All right, so this is, I think these chapters are pretty easy to take 15, 20 minutes on each of these, but this chapter is hard because there's multiple things. So one of the first things you have to have on here is you have to have that this is rest. This is called depolarization. And that name kind of makes sense because the cell down here is polar. The inside is negative, the outside is positive. So there's a polarity, there's a difference. But when you go towards zero, you're depolarizing. Technically, when you go to plus 30, you're repolarizing in an opposite direction. But we call this depolarization. This is called repolarization because we're introducing the polarity again. This is called hyper, as in a hyper is too much, hyperpolarization. And then this is back to rest. You'll notice on this diagram that each of those phases I labeled with is the sodium channel open, is the sodium channel closed, is the sodium channel inactivated. If you look really close, you can see for this part, 
the sodium channel is open and the potassium channel is closed. You can do it that way, or you can do it this way too if it saves space. So I'm gonna make a little bar legend. If you do it this way, you do have to make sure that things line up. So these sodium channels are closed until right there. And they open at that point. And here, they become inactive. So this is closed. This is open. And then never really know where this line is. Like, you really can't be wrong with this line. You do need to know that they go from open to inactivated. And then they go back to closed. And this is sodium. Potassium, potassium opens right here. So it's closed until there. And then it stays open to the bottom of hyperpolarization. So there it's open, and then it's closed again. So that drawing is one of the major pieces of points that you don't want to miss. And so you want to sit down at your kitchen table and make sure you have that. So you have to have it drawn correctly. Every once in a while, you'll see someone, and this is going to be truly heavy for any computer, is you'll just draw this. And that, is not that. There are like a specific collection points in there, so you have to get the shape of this correctly. So that's worth a point. I can't remember exactly how many, but we'll check at the end. You have to know when the, there's rest, depolarization, repolarized, and rest. You have to have closed, open, inactivated, and then closed, open, closed. There's one other thing you need to have too, and that's something called the refractory period. Important. A little bit here. But it's really important in the heart because it prevents cardiac arrest. The refractory period is basically, and people draw it a little bit differently, so it's not too critical that you have it exactly correct. But this right here is called the absolute refractory period. And what it means is you're not going to get another action. You're already at 100%. Action potentials are all or none. There's no big action potentials and small action potentials. And it's not a huge deal, but the reason this matters is because, let's say, like, I'm going to slug hedges in the arm. And let's say it's a friendly hit. How'd you do in that tennis? And then it's a hard hit. Like, I don't know what hedges would do to make you want to hit an arm. But... It's not like this. You don't have small action potentials and large action potentials. All your action potentials are the same size. So it's not this. What it is is, kind of looks like an EKG, but not really tried to. Your action potentials are spread out to indicate a weak stimulus. And then, Your action potentials are scrunched together for a hard hit. That's how you code for intensity. The other refractory period is right here. And it's called a relative. What the relative refractory period does is a super hard hit. means you can get action potentials that don't really come down. But it takes a super hard hit because it's hard to get the action potentials that scrunched together. The other reason this is going to come up later is it explains why action potentials only go one way down in neuron. Okay, so you're going to want to leave a little space here. You're going to want to leave a little space under your neuron. But draw a neuron.
have like a dendrite out here. Yeah. I like like that. Just like she has it. I like a little space under here. I like a little space over here. And then we do need some space here because we're gonna do things like here's my soma. So that's my new guess. This is gonna be myelin. Myelin is the all the dendrocytes. You technically don't have to write myelin, but it has to be on there. This is called a node of Ranvier. And the reason you have nodes of Ranvier is because they do separate your voltage dependent channels. So you have a ton of voltage dependent channels in here. And then they do line the axon. Those were sodium. You do have acid in here too. This thing here, I don't know. This thing here, it wants to get to minus 55. It's called the axon helix. If your neuron was a gun, the axon pillage is the trigger. So this is like the trigger. The way this is going to work is you're going to get the axon pillage to negative 55. So remember over here, we're sitting at negative 70. We got to get to negative 55. If we get to negative 55, then sodium channels open. And so these sodium channels open, and sodium comes pouring in. And technically, it goes both directions. But the main direction we care about is it's going to go down. Sodium's a positive ion. It's going, to, it's going to go down to the next channel. And those sets of channels are waiting to get to minus 55. If they get to minus 55, they open, and sodium comes rushing in. So now these guys get to minus 55, sodium comes rushing in, and it goes to the next node of Ranvier. And then this guy's like, okay, it's not negative 70 below me anymore, it's negative 55 below me, so now I'm going to open, and I'm going to let sodium come in. I'm going to let sodium come in. And so this is called saltatory conduction. Because the signal jumps down the axon. Or another way to think about it, it's literally this action potential is flowing down the neuron. So it's a way as these sodium channels open, these sodium channels open, these sodium channels, the signal is going down the neuron in a pretty fast way. I don't think this is really important, but just as you have sodium coming in, you have to have potassium leaving. So as sodium is coming in here, then potassium is leaving back here to get yourself back to rest. And so this action potential literally shifts down, activate, but there's a wave behind the activation that's returning you back to rest. Momental break. That's called an action potential. And we're writing this to differentiate it from something called a gradient potential. Because there's two different types of potentials. An action potential has voltage dependent channels. So that's an abbreviation of voltage dependent. And the signal jumps. So it's probably better to look at it here, but I'm kind of OCD. So I want to draw it this way to you. Is it, if this is a cell and you have ion channels, probably should have used sodium, but this is still. 
the signal jumps and travels. That's what an action potential is. A graded potential is signal just spreads. So you can also have channels that just let the signal come in and spread around. Nobody's boosting it. So maybe another way to think about the action potential is you have boosters. The signal dissipates a little bit, but you made it to the next channel, so the next channel boosts the signal. The reason you want to know that is because this is happening out here. These are graded potentials. Okay, so now that we have that in the board, let's go back to what the heck DJ's talking about with an umbrella. So I was a stay home dad for three years, it was awesome. If you can swing that and get yourself a shirt, mom would do it. It's awesome. Before I was a stay home dad, I remember I heard rain, I would immediately say, I'm not taking an umbrella because I'm tough. Or I would say, literally, I don't think I owned an umbrella until I had a kid. So I had no umbrella. So I had a little umbrella neuron that never decided to take an umbrella. There was a time, so you could make this positive if you wanted to, or for me personally, it was actually negative as a funeral. But I did get one. I had to go out and buy it for a funeral. So then that is a pro. Yeah, I am going to take an umbrella. So everything around here, the greens are pros. Yes, take an umbrella. And the reds are cons. No, I'm not taking an umbrella. So when Ella was about two, I loved it because it was like gym, hot time, library, play group every week. And then nap. And then I'd eat my bowl of spaghetti, and then I'd get to take a nap too. But then one day, I took Ella to the gym, and it looked like rain, but I wasn't going to take an umbrella. But we left the gym, and it was raining a little bit, and she hated it. She She's thrown two tantrums in her life. She's just kind of a go-with-the-flow kind of kid. One was, I don't know what caused it, but it was a horrible tantrum. But the other tantrum was the time that she got wet because I didn't take an umbrella. So at that point, I had to learn, that's like an uber pro, a huge pro all of a sudden. Yes, but taking Ella from the age of three until, I don't know, I asked her the other day, do you still really hate the rain? And she's like, not the same. I suppose it's because sports teacher you have to play in the rain anyway so anyway so she's not that way anymore but at that time it was if l is going i'm taking an umbrella so my metaphor here that the neuron that is making the decision is do i take an umbrella on your test you have to come up with your own metaphor you can't steal mine you come up with a metaphor seven decisions pro versus con you can have six pros and one con six cons and one pro it can be as simple as do i study do i go to work today do i go to class today but you just think through what are the pros and cons of a simple we're going to come back to how you get pros versus cons, but the first thing in the decision is there's strong pros and there's weak pros, and there's strong cons and there's weak cons. So what's the difference between, well, I suppose that was a strong con, but what'd be another pro that's kind of weak? Oh, the other weak one that I have is my mother-in-law. M-I-L would say, DJ is right here today, you should take an umbrella, of course. I'm not inclined to listen to my mother-in-law, so that's a weak pro, whereas Ella is a strong pro. So chapter six is how do you have weak pros versus strong pros? How do you get different strengths of input? So six is how do you get different strengths of input? So we're not doing pro versus con yet. We'll do that next. We're doing how to get pro versus pro. How to get different strengths. And the answer here, as it's referred to as Ohm's law, because Ohm's law talks about ions moving. Technically, I also talk about water and other things or air moving, but it's ions moving. And we'll kind of jump into. I'll jump into a little bit of pro first. But for example, what Ella does. As a pro, she lets sodium in.
That's how you get a pro. We're going to write that on the board again. And we're going to touch on how you get these negatives. These negatives are either, either you let chloride in or you let potassium out. The reason we had to jump to that is because I want you to see that there's like a math here. It's not really a math, but there's a math of L is going to try and let sodium in, and that's going to try and get down to the oxide hill. It can get me to negative 55 millivolts. Meanwhile, over here, the fact that I don't have an umbrella or can't find an umbrella is going to let chloride in. And when chloride goes in, it makes VM more negative. So that's going to get me farther away from 55. If I'm tough, that's going to let potassium out. That's going to make the inside of the cell more negative. So that's also going to get my axon hill like further away from minus 55. So there's like a race here to get to minus 55. Because if you get to minus 55, you'll open up those sodium channels and you have an actual potential. So what governs whether these ions make it down here is Ohm's law. And what governs what makes these line, what governs letting these ions down here also basically determines their strength. Because if Ella is right next to the axon hillock, she's going to have more influence on the axon hillock than mother-in-law that's way out here. So you have to picture, maybe picture moving people or moving tiny little ions. You want to get 50, you want to get to negative 55 down here. This is going to determine, well, what makes this one stronger than this one? So the first thing is... The closer the synapse is to the axon hillock, the stronger it is. So, the closer the synapse is to the axon hillock, the stronger. So that's Ella versus mother-in-law. Ella is closer to the axon hillock. She's going to have more influence on the axon hillock than mother-in-law. Leave a space, because we want to put in learning. So leave a space between here. The bigger the dendrite, the stronger the input. So again, we're trying to get the axon hillock to negative 55. And technically, Ella is on the soma, which is a really big dendrite. So there's no like funneling. There's no like restriction to the flow of the sodium that's coming in getting to the axon hillock. Whereas over here, mother-in-law, when she lets sodium in, it's kind of narrowed by the narrow dendrite. So it's not going to, all that sodium is not going to make it to the axon hillock because it gets spread out. Reminds me of my high school, it was old high school, and there was a particular place where three floors came into two floors to an addition, and that place was always a choke between classes because it narrowed. So if you try and take a bunch of people and narrow them through a tunnel or narrow them through a door, it slows everything down. So this dendrite being narrow means mother-in-law is weaker than Ella. And then the last one is these neurons can release different amount of neurotransmitter. So neurons that release more neurotransmitter. Neurons that release more neurotransmitter are stronger. So then let's put learning in here. Because in one tantrum, I had to learn that this always means activate the axon hillock. So how did that happen? Well, synapses can move closer. Maybe the better metaphor is maybe my mother-in-law just gets really good at predicting the type of rain where you do want an umbrella, a really strong downfall. Uh, what am I trying to say? Downboard. And so then I want to learn that, hey, mother-in-law is a pretty good predictor. Maybe you should take an umbrella. So the first thing that can happen is synapses can move closer to the axon hillock. 
So there's evidence that this guy all of a sudden becomes strong. And so it moves closer. It crawls closer to the axon hillock, or maybe even it extends way over here and gets on top of the axon hillock. There is evidence that the synapse that's most <laughs> often can move closer to the axon hillock. Or there's definitely evidence, there's really good evidence of this, that the dendrites get bigger. It's like if you had a building where a hallway is always clogged, you'd build a bigger hallway. So this dendrite can get bigger. The third thing is, is neurons, and this one definitely happens, and this one's the fastest, is neurons release more neurotransmitters. So this says neurons release more neurotransmitters. And that makes them stronger. Three more chapters, but they're short. <laughs> Chapter seven. Let's just clarify, and I think we can probably kind of line them up. Pros versus cons. So what I'm drawing here is the umbrella neuron. Pink neuron. I'm going to draw pros first. A pro and then next we'll draw a con. You should know the technical name. I mean, I'm using pros and cons because they're decision making, but technically a pro is called an excitatory postsynaptic potential, or it's called an EPSP, excitatory postsynaptic potential, it's called an EPSP. You could write it down here too if you want to. If you want to know what do we mean by post Presynaptic, postsynaptic. This is called the presynaptic. Where should we draw? This is the pre. I don't want to write it down. Pre synaptic neuron. And this, the umbrella neuron, is the post synaptic neuron. So pre means before the synapse, and then this is called the synapse in between. So the synapses where two neurons come together. The first neuron coming in is called the presynaptic neuron. The last neuron that's receiving information is called the postsynaptic neuron. And the only reason you really need to know that is why is it called an excitatory postsynaptic potential? It's called an excitatory postsynaptic potential because it's going to raise VM. This is going to increase VM in the target. And the way it's going to do that we kind of tipped our hand down here, is there's going to be channels down here, and they're going to be voltage gated channels. I'm sorry, they're going to be ligand gated channels. And they are going to let some in. That's what an EPSP does. It lets some in. Then you have an inhibitory. Postsynaptic potential. And that one's called an IPSP. What's an IPSP do? It decreases VM. Makes the voltage further away from negative 55. How does it do that? It either and these are ion channels down here, and they're ligand gated. It either lets chloride in, or 
or it lets potassium out. So chapter seven is pros and cons. Again, trying to get the trigger to 55. Pros get it closer to 55. Cons get it further away from 55. Eights. It's called synaptic transmission. And nine is going to be cleaning up neurotransmitters. So if you have room, draw one more thing. I might have to write the words. Um, maybe I'll try to slide it over so I can write the words next to it. The key, so this is just elegant, the first thing that has to happen is you have to get to plus 30. So the whole point of sending this action potential down here is to get this to plus 30. Or that's what all these guys have to do too, is they have to get to plus 30. So raise VM to plus 30. Step two is there are all kinds of, I don't know that you need to switch colors here. But this is a voltage dependent calcium channel. So step two is open the dependent calcium channels. So calcium, this is going to be important because you're going to hear so many times that calcium is an on switch in the body. Calcium is how one neuron talks to another neuron. Calcium causes muscle contraction. Calcium controls heart rate. Calcium controls heart strength. Calcium is often released to get endocrine hormones to be released, so calcium does a lot. And in fact, you have a savings account of calcium that's so important, that's your bones. You have a checking account for calcium, that's albumin. So you have calcium circulating through your blood right now in a checking account because calcium is so important. Your neurons, they store neurotransmitters in little vesicles. Calcium, if we can continue this line, calcium comes down and opens the vesicle. Calcium opens neurotransmitter vesicles. And neurotransmitter is released. So then step, this is step two. This is step three, and then step four would be if you have this neurotransmitter spilling out. So when you draw your drawing, technically, you can just do that, this in the middle, and you've got the four steps. You've drawn the four steps. Or sometimes people just memorize both, because if you have them both, you have to really memorize. You can do either the words or you can do the picture. It doesn't matter. It just has to be one or the other. Running out of space, you should release enough neurotransmitter to stimulate each receptor once and only once and clean up the rest. So here again is where, since I'm stuck, I'm going to have to draw it. So the first thing that you can do to clean up neurotransmitter is it just diffuses away. It just leaves the cleft. So 
Step one, if I had room, I'll write it here, diffusion. Or here, it's just this stuff is diffusing away. That's one way you get rid of extra neurotransmitter. It just goes away. It gets cleaned up by the astrocyte eventually. The other one is you can have enzymatic breakdown. You have enzymes in the cleft that destroy the extra neurotransmitter. So that's enzymatic breakdown. And that one's important in a disease called myasthenia gravis. Don't really need to know that, other than it's one of those cases where this matters. So in myasthenia gravis, um, this is a motor neuron. This is a muscle. The connection between the muscle and the motor neuron is destroyed, or maybe I'll just draw it really quick. Is, here's a muscle. Trying to attempt to draw muscle. Um, there's a neuron, and you've got little channels in here. In myasthenia gravis, the immune system knocks those out. And so now when the motor neuron tries to tell the muscle to contract, it doesn't have as many receptors, and so the muscle is weak. One of the ways you can recover the muscles for the people is there's an enzyme in here that breaks down the, the neurotransmitter. You inhibit that enzyme so that it sticks around the neurotransmitters to turn longer. What's the weakest muscle in the body? Your eyelids. Your eyelids are your weakest muscles. So if you get myasthenia gravis, you start to see in the eyelids first. So grandma or grandpa has really droopy eyelids. It's myasthenia gravis. And again, just to come back, this is more of an AMP2 topic, but I have little eye do. I must be not stressed that much these days because I don't really see any. But generally, once you already have an autoimmune disorder, you want to keep an eye out for other autoimmune, autoimmune disorders. So if you have lupus or you have vitiligo or any one of those things, you're always wanting to keep a look up. All right, the last thing is, and this is an important one, is sometimes this neurotransmitter is just taken back up. So three is pumped back up. So three is neurotransmitter is pumped back into presynaptic neuron. And that one is important because there's something called a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. So I probably should have said reuptake. I mean, technically it's pumped back up, but this is called reuptake. Do you know what SSRIs are? If there's a time when a third of everyone, a third of everyone in the United States was on SSRIs. So turn to your right, turn to your left, one of you is on antidepressants. So SSRIs are antidepressants because the serotonin is released into the cleft, and normally it's pumped back up. But if they inhibit the pump, the serotonin sticks around longer, and serotonin is a known mood neurotransmitter. It's really weird because it doesn't work for weeks. In fact, they speculated that some people got their energy back enough before their mood improved, which you don't want for somebody that's suicidal because then they have the energy to commit suicide because their mood is not improved. Those are SSRIs. 